Welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Jason Rugg, and joining us is our documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey there, Jason. How are you today? Good. I'm glad to be here. It's been a yeah. while. We haven't recorded one of these in a bit. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you. Glad we're back. Yeah. And we're also joined by a special guest, Dimitri. Hi, Dimitri. <laughs> How you doing? Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, we are so excited to have you. Jason, I'm just going to jump in and tell everybody how Dimitri ended up here on this podcast. Uh, so Dimitri is uh, a friend that I met at the Julian Dubuque Film Festival. Was it two years ago, Dimitri? That's exactly right. Yeah, two years ago. He had a wonderful film there called My Fairy Tale. Um, is my fairy? Is that the whole title? My fairy tale? You're just missing true. It's almost there. My, my true, true fairy. fairy. Yes, That's my it. true fairy tale. An award-winning film, feature film. It was your first one, right? It's a, it was the first feature. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, so it was a ma- and it won, right? Didn't it win? It was nominated, but it did not uh, win. Oh, dang it! Oh. In my mind, it won. In my mind, <laughs> yours <it> absolutely. Did. <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine did, but we can save that till doc. You view deja vu when you talk about your favorite documentary. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so anyway, Dimitri and I met. Uh, we hit it off right away. He and his wife Tally. Uh, I think they're amazing filmmakers, and I wanted to get to know them better. We have this uh, Julian Dubuque Film Festival coming up next week. In fact, as you are listening to this podcast, uh, it comes out on Wednesday, so we will be there starting on. Thursday, uh, because your brand new short film festival is also nominated at JDIF this year. Yes, we're, we're very, very excited and very, very honored that it just happened that way. Yeah, congratulations. Now, this is a little twist for us, this uh, podcast, because typically we are covering documentary films or documentary filmmakers, but I did not want to let this opportunity pass. Dimitri is a narrative filmmaker, and since this podcast is kind of growing into uh, a filmmaking podcast where we're focusing on filmmaking things, um, Dimitri and I had an idea um, about sort of the top three tools that every filmmaker ought to have in their filmmaking toolkit. And he used those beautifully in this amazing short film that he uh, just finished. So we wanted to talk about that short film, pick his brain for, you know, wisdom that he can share with us. And um, yeah, so that's why he's here. And we are so excited. Can't wait to hear more about it. But before we start, Jason's going to read your bio. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Dmitry was born in the former Soviet Union, uh, launched his dream of filmmaking in 2015. Uh, Since 2016, several of his short films have won numerous awards at international film festivals. His short Shade of Music was acquired by PBS in 2016. Um, And then in 2017, a fatal accident claimed the life of Dmitry's daughter, Alyssa. Uh, in February 2020, Dimitri completed his first feature film dedicated to his daughter, My True Fairy Tale, which Christian saw at that film festival. Uh, he wrote, directed, and produced the film that was acquired for worldwide distribution by Gravitas Ventures. It received theatrical and on demand release in April of 2021. The world premiere of My True Fairy Tale was held at the Cin- Cin- Cinequest <laughs> at the Cinequest in March 2021. So there you go. And we're here to talk about your new film, The Hedgehog. Yeah. Um, well, essentially, Hedgehog is a, uh, is a is a very simple story about a six year old Ukrainian girl who gets dropped off at her grandmother's house in a remote village in a forest in Ukraine while her parents go off to fight the Russians in the war. In a shack outside, she discovers a badly wounded Russian soldier. The two become friends. And then it unfolds as it will. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we just, you, you so graciously let Jason and I watch this beautiful film. I'm going to let Jason uh, just give his first reaction. Jason, what did you think about this film? What did it make you feel? Um, Would you recommend it? What do you think? Oh yeah. I I would definitely highly recommend this film. Um, It's such a simple story that we truly need right now uh you know i just oh man i was <laughs> i was close to tears um it, uh, from this this short it was absolutely incredible such an emotional piece um and i think that this this film really keys in on 
Uh, one thing I love about art and filmmaking in general is that it doesn't have to come to the table with an answer. It comes to the table with a question. And the question is, what do you do when faced with this situation? And I absolutely loved it. It incredibly emotional, incredibly well done. Uh, thank you so much for sharing it. it. It absolutely, when this, when there's a way to watch this, people need to watch it. <laughs> Everybody who's listening to this needs to go and watch, watch this short. Yeah. And we'll invite you to come and meet Dimitri at the Julian Dubuque Film Festival um, next weekend. And I will be there as well. I'm doing a coffee talk on April 27th. Dimitri, do you know when your film is screening at the film festival? I knew you were going to ask me this. Let me get it from my memory. <laughs> it is screening on the 27th and on the 30th. I know on the 30th, it's screening early in the morning. Uh, I believe it's at 1030 in the morning on the 27th. I believe it's screening around 1 or 2 p.m. Okay, good to know. And we know there's other film festivals in your future, so people could probably track you um, somewhere, I'm sure, on social media or something. We'll talk about that at the end. I sort of want to give my feedback on your film. I was scared to watch this at first because you are a complicated man. You are were born in Russia. You have Ukrainian members of your family. Uh, you are a powerful storyteller, an emotional storyteller, and I was scared that it was going to be either violent or um, just hard to watch uh, because, of course, Ukraine is just so on everybody's mind. And what you did was absolutely beautiful. First of all, I was blown away by the beauty of the film, the cinematography, the way you chose to shoot it. Uh, I loved how carefully you used uh, language and speaking and how the film spoke for itself without over talking. Uh, and so I, I did have so many questions because clearly you brought you to this movie. Uh, and so I want to understand how it felt to have, you know, be in the middle of this conflict over the last 18 months being sort of, in the Russian Ukraine family and talk about how this film, this story developed and just tell us about your journey. Oh, well, thank you very much. Both of you for very, very kind words. Um, want to correct you a little bit. I am not Russian and I'm not Ukrainian. I'm actually okay. Belarus, but Belarus is in between. So you're almost there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Belarus kind of has this very weird situation right now in all of this because it's neither nor, um, although it tends to side a little bit more with Russia than with the rest of the world. Um, I do have family and friends on both sides of the aisle and um, I am fluent. Uh, my first language is Russian and I'm proficient in uh, Belarus and in Ukrainian languages. Um, the film happened extremely, extremely quickly. I am, in fact, I wrote the script in five days. Oh my goodness. Wow. And <laughs> I wrote it two weeks into, uh, into this conflict because nobody imagined that this thing is going to drag as much as a drag. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. and I found overnight family and friends who spoke the same language all of a sudden not speaking to each other. Mm. Mm. In fact, there was, there was hatred. And by the way, this is going to happen for generations to come. It's yeah. unfortunately Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine made a absolutely beautiful call, a speech in Russian language, roughly about two weeks into the war directed to Russian soldiers. It was a call for them to surrender, to put their weapons down and they will be returned to their mothers. They will be treated not the way their army treats them. And that was also part of the inspiration for this film. And certainly bringing in the title of the film, which is almost becomes like a floating signifier, a hedgehog. What is a hedgehog? As you know, hedgehog in wars are tank stoppers. And strangely enough, hedgehog plays a very unique position in Ukrainian and Russian folklore. 
Really? I did not know that. Oh, yeah. Tell me why. I don't know, to be honest with you, but it's just, it's been since childhood, there was, there's always fairy tales and stories about hedgehogs. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So you mean the actual animal, not necessarily. So I'm familiar with hedgehogs because they use them in Normandy. And if you're familiar with any archival footage, you'll see them on the beaches of, you know, Omaha and Utah. And there are these metal X's uh, that are used to stop tanks or boats. And in fact, on the beaches, they would put, the Germans would put mines on top of the hedgehogs so that if a boat ran over it, it would blow it up. Um, but yes, they are to stop tanks. And so you're saying, though, the hedgehog animal is what figures prominently in Russia and Ukraine. Fairy tales, yes, yeah. and folklores and stories and cartoons. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, certainly being a kid growing up in Minsk and Belarus, I was uh, uh, open to that, and I, I would read stories about this. My parents would read me stories. We would watch cartoons about hedgehogs. So it was kind of like always this mystical animal that you grow up with. And so it's not uh, by accident that somebody would have a stuffed animal, which turns out to be also a little character in the film. Yeah, yeah. Well, so talk to me about what you've experienced. As you've said on the outside, now you're living in America, you know, you have this complicated past, complicated family relationships. Um, clearly, you wanted to speak into this reality, this war reality between these countries. What message did you want to get across? Well, uh, you know, obviously, the, the message of love and peace. And again, uh, keep in mind, this was two weeks into this conflict, not even thinking this is going to be a blown out war. This is going to, I mean, when one country goes into another country, this is a war, but, you know, you always hope that this is resolved quickly. And where over a year it hasn't. So uh, my message predominantly was message of love and compassion. And ultimately, um as human beings, we have obligation to be human to each other. And that's really what's the, the, the simplicity of the message. If you want to be a little bit more complicated, um, it's, it's, it, it's, it's the story about what happens when we are faced with an enemy and what separates us when we have to make a choice. And these choices ultimately define us as human beings. Yeah, that was that was so beautiful. And I love how you let the audience kind of process what you're showing on screen, uh, because it does make them think to themselves, what would I do in that similar situation? Um, I think that's what all great filmmakers do. They, you know, show and not necessarily tell. Um I wanted to just talk about the filmmaking aspect of it. This podcast is talk about talking about the three top things uh, that every filmmaker should have in their toolkit. Um, and uh -huh. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you what are the three top things you carry in your toolkit? Well, uh, you, you know, obviously we're we're boiling down to three. There's probably three hundred and three, yeah. but ultimately, I think it all starts uh, with the story. And um, I think it's very important to uh, be able to tell the story that you want to tell. And when I say you, a filmmaker, obviously. And um, uh, it sounds very easy, but in reality, it's not because you have to live with the story for a while. And I mean a while. It could take a year or two or maybe five and so you have to really, really massage and know the story inside out. And it really, really has to speak to you. And you have to almost have this passion to share this story with the world. So true. Now, when we talked about what kind of tools we would talk about today, you used two words that I thought were genius. You said economic storytelling. And we've never talked about that as we've talked about mm -hmm. writing um, during this podcast. But uh, I think economy of writing can come into play in two situations. And uh -huh. you can talk more about that. One, in terms of what you have to shoot. So you can look at economic writing from an actual financial standpoint, because um, you can think about when I write, 
I need to consider the budget and I need to think about how much this is going to cost me and I need to write according to whatever budget, you know, we have. That's number one. Number two, it could be economic writing in terms of letting the film speak for itself as opposed to overwriting and having the characters over speak. So when you said to me, let's talk about economic writing, what did you mean? Well, we're talking about the indie filmmaking, right? I mean, um, you know, there's probably no helicopters, there's probably no submarines, and there's probably um, no 300 people that you could put in the room and give them all directions. So you have to be very conscientious of what you're working with and what tools do you have and how this tools could help you tell your story in the best possible way. And so you almost have to software it in your head when you start writing the scenes and you have to be very conscientious where are your entrances and exits. Well, at least for me, because it becomes a very uh, technical process. There is, trust me, there's right art to it, but a lot of it is uh, technical as well. And I think that's part of every indie uh, filmmaker's journey where they um, have to be a little bit conscientious of that, but it is always better if it's on the back of somebody's mind rather than thinking, oh my God, I only have one chair and I only have this door and I can only use this too. No, I mean, within reason, obviously. Yeah, so absolutely. And I think that you probably did this beautifully. I'm guessing you did not fly over to Ukraine to film this story and you did only stay in one-ish location. I mean, I think there are two inside shots but uh, and one outside so, and I can't imagine it took you, you know, three weeks to shoot this. So let's talk about, um, you know, what it actually, like what you were thinking about when you wrote this story in terms of where you would set it and your different locations and what you had available. Um, well, actually I was going to shoot it in upstate New York where I am right now. And uh, um, believe it or not, you'll appreciate this story. Christian, um, I called up a fellow filmmaker whom I met at Julian Dubuque two years ago. How about that? That's awesome. I love it. Networking. And they did a documentary. And I think you remember them. Uh, Regis Forrest. I do. I do. <laughs> so I called up Dave Messick, uh, who owns a pretty big production company in Ocean City, Maryland. And I told yeah. him that I was looking for... Um, a forest. No. I was actually no? looking for authentic Kalashnikovs, AK-47s, oh. the guns that are using in the war. And I know that David oh. is a uh, avid collector of weapons. And okay. he says, well, which ones do you need? I said, which ones do you have? He says, I have them both, the <laughs> Russians and the Ukrainians. He oh, says, why wow. are you asking? I said, well, I just wrote the script and I'm... I don't know how we're going to do this. He's like, send it to me. So I send him the script. He says, get in the car. I'll find you the money and we'll make it happen. <gasps> I love that. I am not kidding you. <laughs> and so this is where you have to take a leap of faith and a little bit of magic and indie filmmaking kind of has to happen. You, you need a little bit of luck. And without knowing Tali and I, uh, we jumped in the car and we went to Ocean City, Maryland and we knew the location of Regis Forest. This yeah. documentary. It's a great documentary, actually. If is it out there? Do you know if Regis Forest is out there? I think they're trying to get it out there. And, okay. Uh, it yeah, certainly a great is a terrific story. one. I definitely check it out if you can. And um uh it's just, it, we saw it and we said, This is great. This is wonderful. And we got a fan, phenomenal uh uh, uh um uh, uh, the person, uh, I don't know, it escapes my mind. The person who designs, the design set, de set designer. Set and the, designer, production uh, designer. Production designer, uh, Deidre Cotero. And uh, uh, Deidre came in and she just, in a matter of five days, with the help of volunteers, um, we were able to transform this little cottage into um, a Ukrainian little hut. Ah, oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So genius. Well, Yes, economic writing is um, in terms of like 
you know, what you're using, what you're shooting, how many days you're shooting. Uh, and just by the way, how many days did you shoot? We shot it in three and a half days. In three and a half days. Can I ask you what your budget was for uh, the whole thing? Our budget wind up being total A to Z, a little bit under $40,000. What? What? That's crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, this is including post-production. This is including marketing. Uh, our production budget was uh, roughly about twenty-five. Yeah, I mean, I really think that's a that's a really good, reasonable budget. I mean, I, it looks much more expensive than that. Um, so that's that's pretty amazing. Thank you. I do know, however, it seemed like there was economy of writing in this script as well. So talk about you know there just was not a lot of dialogue. Talk to me about that choice and. Uh, you told you said to me there were a certain number of lines that you wrote. Talk to me about that. I, I, I actually thought it was twenty two, but my my wife corrected me. I think it's twenty nine. Whichever case is, I it I have this very weird way the way I approach uh, screenwriting. I always approach a scene with the um, um, with how I could tell this story without one word of dialogue. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, you, there's just no way you could tell uh, a scene without a dialogue. But I come from the place where, how do I let the action dictate the uh, uh, the way the film is going to go? And this was certainly uh, the case in this film because um, um, these are absolutely two different worlds that collide. The world of a little girl, the world, the world of grandma, and then there's a world that's going outside. And I also wanted the audience to experience that world in this stillness and sort of have this invisible soundtrack dictate a lot of the dialogue as well. Yeah, so how did you, when you were envisioning, envisioning the story, if you're not, if your mind isn't full of words and, you know, the script is not coming to you, what were you, what was going on in your head? What did you see? How did this idea come to you? Well, uh, um, the idea, the, the little girl came to me because I wanted to tell the story in a very innocent voice. And I think the most innocent voice that you could tell the stories is this uh, a voice of a, um, uh, of a little girl. So, Dimitri, as I was watching this, what I did wonder if, you know, since you did, you know, use language and, you know, uh, dialogue so sparingly, how did you envision this film? What were you thinking about when you wrote it and how you wanted to tell it, particularly if you wanted other things other than dialogue to carry the film? Well, that's, that's, it's, a, it's a tough question because uh, I also happen to be the writer. And, you know, I always make a joke, oh, the writer kind of knows the director, so we're okay. Um, <laughs> and, and sometimes it's not always okay because you have one film when you write and you envision something and then your director, you have to go and you have to execute and some things are missing or you're not going to get some of the things that you wanted to get. So you have to roll with punches or you have to be flexible and do what's there. Um, for me, as a director, it's very important, the pacing of the film, um, finding the right parts and uh, finding the right composition. And then it all comes down to the pacing. So um, with that regard, I have full trust in my director of photography mm. where he, in this case, was able to guide this beautifully through an image. Mm. A little bit different than what I envisioned originally, nevertheless, another beautiful way of telling this tale. Yeah, so that actually leads us right into uh, our second tool that you need in a filmmaker toolkit, and that is your movie family. So talk mm -hmm. to me. You, you actually came up with this. You said one of the most important tools is your movie family. Here you're talking about the director of photography. When I asked you that question, what did you mean? Well, it's actually quite simple. Um, 
in, I guess uh, the way I think about fo- uh, movie family is just like about family. You know, there's like probably in the family you have like a mother, father, brother, sister, uncles, and um, everyone kind of like you know they they know it's a family. There's like quarrels there, but everybody kind of loves each other, and it's you know I guess one common theme that defines a family is love and so it's very important the type of group uh the your your team that you bring on the set and the type of energy that is present during your shoot because yeah there's going to be probably a couple of moments that one person is not going to be happy with another or some things may not go the right way and you may have to fix a few things and may not be happy but with family, at the end of the day, everybody looks at each other, they hug, and they know it's all about love. And so <laughs> it's very, very important the people that you choose to go to this labor, and which leads, of course, to love, labor of love, mm-hmm. uh, onto the set to ultimately give... Uh, give birth to this beautiful baby. Which is this story. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in, in, along with that, families, I think, really know what the other members of the family are like. They know their pluses and their minuses. Positives and negatives is another way to say it. They know their strengths and their weaknesses. And so I think as a family head, a family leader, you have to look at your family and say, oh, this person has a strength in this area. Let's have them lead with that strength. And maybe they're weak in this area. So we'll bring this other family member in because they're strong in that area. Um, or you can think of it as a chessboard. All of your chessboard have all of these different pieces and they do different things in this little chess battle. And you need to maximize everybody's strengths and minimize their weaknesses. And I hear you saying that with your DP, you put this, you brought this guy into your filmmaking family. And you're like, I have hired him because I know X, Y, Z about him and it will make this film better. Um, and so your director can sort of, you know, take a seat for a minute and allow the DP to stand on the stage and take the, take the lead in some ways. So I'm just, I'm making all that up, but I'm thinking that's what I'm hearing you're saying. Well, that's exactly right. And if you want to even go a little bit further, my my process of um, thinking about the family is um, very similar, but always very different for every project. Uh, and uh, and when we're talking about the family, I don't, we don't, we're not just talking about the director of photography or production designer or the actors. We're also talking about the post production, which mm. would probably lead us to, let's say. Uh, 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 Chris who edited this film or uh, Ali who scored this film and Mm. I start that process early on before I even go into production yeah that's important because I think it's important that this family gets involved early on Mm -hmm. just as you would also do it on the uh, marketing side as well. How do you get the story out there? So you start everything from the very beginning. And again, there's a lot of leap of faith. Well, well, well what happens if you don't finish this film? Well, it, you know, well, what happens if this, but you just have to go with it. And it's an open water, but you have to believe that there's another side of the shore somewhere. I've also found with uh, projects like that, like at, we didn't talk much about my background. I've edited like a hundred episodes of kids TV, like animated stuff. So like being an editor, when a director or writer comes to you early, uh, you can go, Oh, that's going to be a problem before it's even actually a problem. And you can head off those problems that might not make it feasible way earlier when you're all together and and looking at something and going, Oh, in the edit, we need this, this, and this to make that really work or, or, you know, that sort of thing. Building, the team early, like you're talking about, it makes it so much more likely that it will actually succeed. <laughs> and that's exactly right. Um, I couldn't agree more with you, Jason. In fact, um, 
you know, I've reached out. I've always wanted to work with Chris. Chris is an amazing editor who edited Hedgehog. His film um, uh, Breaking with John Boyega won Sundance two years ago. Uh, it's wow. It's currently in. Uh, um, I, I think it's recently finished the theater run, but it's now available on uh, uh, streaming um, platforms. And uh, he read the script and he says, "I, I want to be part of this." And so, um, uh, same thing happened with Ali, uh, who is absolutely an amazing composer. And uh, um, he uh, read the script and he says, um, I want to score live music. And he scored live music. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Do you know what instruments Incredible. he used or were you there on the soundstage as he was recording all of that? I was not. I was not. Um, I did go for part of the post production uh, to LA, but um, I, he, I believe this was um, a cello, um, a, a clarinet, and uh, a violin. I think there was just, just three just instruments. Three instruments. It. And wow. it was literally just three chords. He and, you know, coming wait, from. Wait, wait, wait. Three instruments and three chords throughout the whole movie? Pretty much. Um, wow. And, and, you know, uh, and uh, I've had a nice chat with him where he says that, uh, you know, sometimes it's harder to play just three notes than <laughs> playing arpeggios in very complicated uh, scales. Um, yeah. And uh, coming from a musical background, I'm a classically trained pianist and a classically uh, trained composer as well. Um uh, it was very, um, for me, it was very important of uh, having the score in this film be almost like another character. And so when Ali asked me, what, what do you have in mind for the score? I just gave him one word and I said, I want it to be invisible. And he says, I got it. And I cannot tell you how, like he hit a 10 out of 10 immediately. It was just, it was incredible. Yeah. What I was stunned by is I was, I was aware of the score because it was so beautiful, but you know what it felt like to me? It felt like a river. The score felt like a river that carried the story along and it was powerful. It really did not distract, detract at all. It carried the story beautifully. I was just going to say the same thing. It it felt like it was the emotional through line of the film more than necessarily than the dialogue or the cinematography. That it was like this, these are the emotions that you're going through. It fits so perfectly with the actual roller coaster that I went on. That it it really was, as you say, invisible. It felt like one cohesive piece of media. That's that's fascinating. Uh, thank you, thank you. And if you actually look at the timing of the score in a film. It, uh, I think it's over eight or nine minutes in a seventeen uh, minute film. Like, but you don't even feel that it's it's that much. And again, having this advantage of starting early with your family, Chris, when he was editing, he already had temp scores that were going to be in there, which helped mm -hmm. quite a bit with the pacing. Yeah, I did that with Jeff Kurtenacker, who was the composer for The Girl Who Wore Freedom. We involved him very early on because I started actually at first with temp scores from like Hans Zimmer or something like that. And I saw myself getting used to that. And Jeff didn't like that. And I didn't like that. And so we were like, well, what if you create some things we could use to cut to, which was super helpful for us. And then in the end, it was giving him an idea of how to build the whole story. So I, I'm glad to hear that. I'm not the only one. I thought I was just a bad director and didn't know what I was doing, but you used that actually on purpose. Well, you could have fooled me. It was yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, you. Yeah, I, I did this. Um, uh, we, we've tried this and it, it worked. And, like everything seemed to kind of work that way. Oh. That's amazing. All right. So uh, we're going to go on to the third tool in the toolkit. Do you remember what you told me the third tool was? I did. And I actually wrote it down. And it's, um, uh, uh, well, no, we actually spoke about it. We spoke about economic writing. Yep. We spoke about uh, um, the family. Movie, fa movie family. And we spoke about the importance that you choose 
the story that is important to you to a point where it's going to drive you crazy because you're going to have to live with this for X amount of years. That's right. So, yeah. And so, you know, the way that you put it to me as I was looking at this is you said the third tool was stories that matter to capital Y-O-U. And I love that. Stories that matter to you. And when I look at this film and I know your background, clearly this story mattered to you uh, so much so that it came out of you and you had to do it. Yeah. 100%. Um, and um, I felt that I had to make a very strong statement in the place where I could not, my voice could not be very loud. And so I wind up doing this, um, this, well, what came out, I wind up making the statement in a very um, gentle voice of a six year old girl who I guess um, will touch people and hopefully speak to people. Yeah. Well, it certainly did for me. I could tell that your heart was uh, in this 100%. And, um, you know, I think that's what made it powerful. And this is the same story with the girl who wore freedom. That story meant so much to me. And I could not sleep unless I told the story, gave birth to the story and shared it with the world. And I think those are the most powerful pieces for sure. 100%. Couldn't agree with yeah. you more. Now, Jason, I'm wondering, you've been sitting there listening. You did weigh in on the editing part. Uh, but do you have any thoughts or questions for Dimitri at this point? Yeah, I've been I've been trying to think of, because you covered so many incredible little pieces about this, and I'm still kind of processing the film. So I've been trying to, <laughs> trying to come up with something to ask. And I, I think what, what I would love to know from you is from a writer director standpoint um how much of your initial what you wrote on the page do you think made it through to the final film i would love to know that that process you know is it like you know 50 percent? is it 100 percent? you know what did you trim stuff down did you add stuff in on the day you know what what did you really go on there um i think um and, and you know, I um, as 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 an eternal student of the um, art, I look at the screen at Hedgehog and I cringe at so many places where I'm like, oh, why did I do this here? Oh, why this moment is not there? And, and this is normal. That said, I would say my vision from a visual standpoint, I would say I'm about 75, 80 percent there. Okay. Wow. As far as the catharsis and as far as what you take away, I would say I'm 95% there. So, uh, but for me, it is always going to be a work in progress because the minute you've uh, achieved this perfection, there's, there's, there's no longer need for you to do this anymore. You've achieved it. You've done it. And I don't think that perfection ever comes. And there's always this missing piece. And um, uh, frankly speaking, there's a couple of moments that uh, either Ali, the composer, or uh, Chris, the editor, found that I said, oh, my God, that's brilliant. Why didn't I think of that before? <laughs> and there were certainly a couple of moments where like, oh, my God, how are we going to fix this? We don't have another shot of this. How are we going <laughs> to do this? Um, and uh, uh, to our rescue, our, our beautiful colorist, Juan came in in, uh, in LA and was able to bail us out out of a couple of spots. But it's just, it's, it's a family effort. It goes back again to the family. And you have to have trust because with a loving family, there's always uh, an interest for this one little thing, and that's the baby. Mm. That's great. Oh, man, Dimitri, you are just one of my favorite filmmakers ever. I love your passion and the heart that you bring to all of your projects. I mean, you bring you 
actually. That's the toolkit you bring because your heart for others, your love for people, uh, your love for, I think, country, whether it's, you know, the ones in Europe or the ones here in the United States, uh, you just kind of exude passion for all of those things. And I see it in your work. Uh, So congratulations on this amazing accomplishment. Talk to me about the film festivals that it's been in, what you've, you know, any awards you've won and where it's going next. So um, uh, we started, we opened the film in Sedona, Arizona this February. So it's, uh, we're just finishing the third month and uh, we uh, screened at uh, Kansas City International. We won a little uh, festival, a very nice festival in Pennsylvania called Northeast Pennsylvania, just actually uh, this past Sunday. Um, we are nominated in Dubuque. Um, we are nominated in May for the best short in Pilagos in Spain in Cantabrian region. Wow. Um, uh, there are a um, couple of uh, really big festivals that are coming up, but unfortunately I've been sworn by secrecy. I'm not allowed to say what they are, but uh, it, in Dubuque, I will be able to share next week. I'll be able to share one of uh, Oscar nominated festivals we have been actually we've screened at Cleveland International Film Festival, which is also oh, Oscar a, nominated film festival. Yeah, it's a big one. That's great. Um, I apologize if I'm missing any festivals because it's. I think we're in 15 right now. So I um, and uh, there's another four that are coming that I'm also not allowed to say. <laughs> well, congratulations. We will keep an eye out on things. Uh, do you have? Can we follow you on social media? Do you have social media for this film or your filmmaking company? Uh, we do have social media and, uh, oh, this is very embarrassing. I can never remember. I think it's <laughs> the, the hedgehogfilm.com. That's it. Oh. You, your website is the hedgehog, hedgehogfilm.com. We will also link that in the story comments. Uh, and I'm looking right now at your website and I'm trying to see if you have any social media links there. You have uh, Facebook and Instagram. That's the correct. Instagram, That's the correct. Instagram is the Hedgehog Film. You can find that on Instagram, and Facebook is also the Hedgehog Film. All Great. One so. Thank you. Jason is our Sweet. trusty, dusty research, uh, resource extraordinaire is that what research extraordinaire. <laughs> research. <laughs> yeah yeah mm. okay anyway that's fantastic uh we will you know hopefully other people can see this film uh we wish you the best in dubuque uh thank you for sharing your experiences with us uh we can all aspire to be uh to follow in your footsteps dimitri truly uh oh, great work that's... Thank you so much. Although I do not want to leave without talking about your lovely producer, your beautiful wife, Tali. Uh, give a little shout out. Tell us about her. And I think you guys had a surprise happen about 10 months ago. We did. We had absolutely <laughs> the most amazing surprise that beats any Oscar, any filmmaking or anything. And that's our little girl. Her name is Olivia. She was born in June of last year. And um, she's going. She's coming up to be one years old, and uh, we're we couldn't be more proud. She's just um, she's just such a little ball of joy. Ugh. That's wonderful. Oh. Yeah, Tally is a creative genius. She's a wonderful production partner. I think for you, uh, she's a great producer. And I'm sure Absolutely. she had her hand in this film. Um, it, yes, from A to Z, uh, and. Not to mention that she was six months pregnant when she was doing this. So, oh, my goodness. Um, and um, she aced this. Um, and oh, honestly, I, I, I'm so fortunate to have someone by my side like this uh, who actually loves filmmaking and who uh, who created such an incredible um, atmosphere to have this be a possibility. And of course I can't leave out Dave Messick and Simona Callen, the uh, guys of unseen productions who uh, created that for us in Maryland. Um, again, would not be possible without them. I mean, again, you have to mention everybody. So like um, our wonderful cast, uh, um, I don't know. What did you think of the little girl? You know, the acting was great, honestly. Truthfully, it was so good. I didn't notice the acting, which is the best. Truthfully, (laughs) you know, it did. 
I didn't go, oh my gosh. I mean, independent films oftentimes make me cringe and usually it's because of the acting. This was not the case in this film. Uh, they were yeah. just top-notch talent. It, you know, Emma, um, um, Emma Pearson, who plays the lead, she's, um, uh, she's, by the way, she's fluent, uh, in Russian, she's fluent in Ukrainian, and she's fluent in English. So, uh, I, when I saw her eyes, I said, Oh my God, please be a good actress because these <laughs> eyes will speak to millions of people. And she was such a pro. Um, and the same thing was happened with Elena, who plays the mom and the soldier, Vlad. Um, so it was just it, like the world conspired and it just all happened so quickly and it just all f fell in the right place. That's awesome. Incredible. One question I wanted to ask you was, what do you want people to walk away with when they see your film? Love, love, hmm. nothing but love and compassion. That's it. Well, I certainly felt that way. I certainly felt that way. So uh, hopefully that will continue on as you go on your film festival journey. I look forward to seeing you, uh, you know, next week. But it's not time to go yet. It's not time to go yet. It is now time for our segment, DocuView Deja Vu. All right, here we are. We have arrived. And Dimitri, we ask everybody to bring a documentary film that they love I loved your answer, but what are you bringing to the table? What's your favorite documentary? I will be very honest, and this is also very embarrassing to admit, I don't get to watch a lot of films. I watch films when I do my preparations for projects, but I don't get to watch a lot of documentary films. Um, the um, last uh, two documentaries that I truly enjoyed was actually in Dubuque. Um, one was Regis Forrest and the other one was The Girl Who Wore Freedom, which is your documentary. It, <laughs> and, and the way, you know, I, I'm still quite new to this, uh, particular genre. Um, and the way I could tell is how the barometer of my feelings and coming out, watching your film, you get goosebumps. And for me, this was like, yeah, like you, you, I felt myself being on that battlefield. I felt myself being next to that girl. And mm -hmm. at times I felt being that little girl. And so it's, it's just, it, it, it's, it, it was an amazing, an amazing film that stayed with me. And by the way, um, Tali and I, we watched it again on the plane flying from Guadalajara in Mexico back to the States. It was on Delta Airlines. Yes, it was. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you, you flew with me, uh, you know, as you were flying around. So that's, that's beautiful to say. Thank you very much. I do think that, like you said before, bringing you to the, to the thing that you're writing, bringing, you know, love to your story. That's what you feel. I brought my own emotions. I was on an emotional roller coaster. I wrote that into my script. Uh, it's, it impacts other people when you bring that to what you're writing. So 100%. yeah. So thank you. I appreciate that. All right, Jason, what are you bringing today? Yeah. So I don't have a documentary either. I don't watch all that many documentaries, just like Dimitri. <laughs> I think we're going to have to change the name of our podcast. <laughs> Can't be but, documentary anymore. But I Filmmaking have, first. <laughs> I do have an interesting um, little podcast I want to recommend. Um, there's a show that I absolutely love since fourth season just started back. It's called Barry on HBO. It's one of my all time favorite shows. It's hilarious and incredibly dark and sad and, it, it bounces between being a tragedy and a comedy within the same minute oftentimes. And it's fascinating. Um, and so there, the prestige TV podcast is doing a series with the director and writer and actor uh, who's in it, uh, Bill Hader. And mm. he broke down the first two episodes of season four. And they're absolutely just fascinating to listen to, to listen to him talk about being the actor, director, writer, of a gigantic HBO show and how much pressure that is, but also, you know, letting the story really lead the character lead everything. It's just a really good listen. If you're into creative things and, and also if you like Barry, <laughs> it's just <laughs> so good. Absolutely. Uh, love it. So awesome. Thank you, Jason. 
Okay, well, I'm bringing um, a doc- an actual documentary today. I do love watching documentaries. I watch almost one a day. Um, <clears throat> this one, uh, believe it or not, we're going to stick with the D-Day theme because it caught my eye. I was watching Mandalorian, and one of this, uh, another film was advertised on the Disney Channel, and it was Eyewitness D-Day. And I thought, how many more times do I have to watch something about D-Day you know, to learn something <laughs> new? And I was actually very interested in this film because I didn't really think it was a documentary. And so I asked my husband at the beginning, you know, I kind of watched the trailer and I was like, what is this? Is it a documentary? Is it a drama? And uh, we looked at what it was and it it's listed on IMDb as a documentary, but it's really a documentary, a docu, like a docu drama, like a drama. Um, And here's the tagline or the summary. One famous day, five heroes, five key turning points that changed the course of World War II during the D-Day landings, told through the eyes of the people who made the difference, using rarely seen archive, dramatic reconstruction, and written accounts from eyewitnesses and personal testimony from the five heroes, this is D-Day as never seen before. And I actually kind of have to agree. So what they did was they did take archival footage and historical reenactments enactments and they put those together and then they took the written personal accounts of veterans that were there and instead of having the veteran tell the story which of course they're most of them are not alive anymore they had actors who played those veterans read or say the lines so it was this Hmm. hybrid between a narrative and a documentary that i had never really seen before and typically you know you don't i don't like that kind of stuff, even though I kind of made one of those films, but I typically don't like that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, um, but this was interesting because it felt so much more narrative. Um, it really mm. felt like I was watching a narrative feature, not a documentary. So, uh, oh. it's on that it's national geographic is, uh, where who made it. It's actually a UK version of the story. It's not an American version of D day. Uh, so mm. I thought that was interesting as well. Cause I'm so immersed in the American story of D day and you can find it on Disney, Disney plus. So oh. uh, there you have it. Um, that is my recommendation. All right, Jason. Well, we've kind right. of come Any- to the end of our show. Anything else we need to cover before we wrap up? Um, the only thing, I just a quick update. I wanted to let people know that in May, on May 19th, there is an 80th anniversary ball for the 101st Airborne Division at the Opryland Hotel in Nashville. It is an open event. Anyone can come. The tickets are about $105. I'm going to be there along with my son, Hunter, Ben Fythen, our CEO, and several other people that have worked on our film, because on May 20th, there is a screening at uh, the 101st Airborne Home of Fort Campbell in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. It's only about an hour and a half west of Nashville. And so um, you could come to the ball and hang out with me, come to see the girl who wore freedom uh, the next day. And then we're going to be filming interviews for our next documentary, Taking Carenton on Fort Campbell, kind of that following week. So we have all of that going on. And I will go directly from there uh, back to Normandy for D-Day. So Delta is again chartering a flight for World War II veterans. I'm included on that charter flight and hopefully the Girl Who Wore Freedom will be showing on Delta again. We're working on that agreement as of right now. Uh, and so we are going to um, fly over to Normandy with these veterans and I'll be there probably the month of June after D-Day is over. I actually hope to travel in the footsteps of my great uncle who was with the 84th infantry division and go all the way up into Germany. So that's happening with our company at the same time. I'd love to encourage people to follow us on Instagram in particular, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, TikTok, if you want, we are starting to share a lot of these micro documentaries that we are making uh, that give a lot of history uh, about stories of service. So if you haven't been following us, please follow us. The 101st Airborne Division has begun collaborating with us. So we've been going from, you know, 230 views on our Instagram page up to 22,000. And our Instagram audience is growing. So we're excited about that. We're also releasing YouTube shorts 
podcasts. So we're releasing these little micro docs, just trying to get people to follow us and build our audience. So if you're listening to this, we really would appreciate you following along on our journey. So that's the update for today. Well, all right. I guess it's time to wrap up. Dimitri, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. We've loved having you here. Loved seeing the film. Just an absolute joy to have you here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, it, it was such a pleasure being here. Good. We encourage everyone listening to go check out thehedgehogfilm.com. When this movie comes out and you can watch it in some way, we need you got to go see it. You got to see it. <laughs> for sure. The trailer so. is on the website. We'll put all those links in the story notes. So make sure you check it out. All right. Well, thank you all for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.